Hi everybody, Andrew Champagne here alongside J.D. Fox for the second edition of Champagne and J.D. of Breeders' Cup Week 2020. For the second straight night, we've got a tremendous guest joining us. J.D., he needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyway because that's just the kind of guy I am. You know him from TVG, you know him on social media, you know him for some of his involvement with my racehorse and as a bloodstock agent. The guy does a whole lot of stuff and he is here for his second appearance on Champagne and JD, the Sarge Nick Hines. Nick, welcome back to the show. Attain. Hut, what a uh, what a privilege and a pleasure and an honor to be back on the uh, on the show with you guys. I, I wasn't quite sure after the first go around. I know JD was under the weather, but I was like, are they going to ask me back? But uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Now, it's going to be a lot of fun tonight. If you didn't see the first show that we did with Ren Carruthers, that's up on our YouTube page as well. That one oh. focuses on Friday. This right. one will focus on Saturday. Uh, Saturday, of course, the second day of the Breeders' Cup. Specifically, we're going to focus on the late pick four, which starts with race number nine on the 12 race program. We'll also each give you a price play to consider for the rest of the Saturday program. So lots of fun things going on. And you know what? We're not going to waste any more time. We're going to get right into it with race number nine, the Breeders' Cup Mile. Traditionally, one of the most wide open races on the Breeders' Cup program. This year, no different. Full field, lots of big prices on the morning lines. The morning line favorite is Ivar, the winner of the local prep here last time out when he took the Shadwell Turf Mile at a big price. Got to tell you, four to one hits me is kind of ridiculous. I am completely against Ivar, and I'm going to go on record as saying this after having done a little bit of research and talked with a bunch of people that are as smart, maybe smarter than I am. Ivar may be, for all intents and purposes, the worst morning line favorite in the history of the Breeders' oh. Mile. Now, that is not to say, from an ability standpoint, he can't win. That is to say, he's going to be nowhere near 4-1. to one. It would not shock me if he was closer to 14-1. to one. Now, it's a big field. It's going to be very, very tough to narrow things down, unless, of course, you're extremely confident. Well, these are really good horses. There are a couple of speed horses that if they get left alone on the lead, it's probably lights out. I'm going five deep to kick off my pick four ticket. My Tom selection is the horse that won this race last year. That's number 12, Uni, and I think Uni is rounding back into form. She loves Keeneland. She is two for three over the surface. Last time out, she won the grade one first lady when she beat a very good field led by Bo Recall and Newspaper of Record, and I think she is going to get the pace that she needs. If you look at her running lines, when she gets a pace to run at outside of Saratoga, which is apparently her kryptonite, she's very tough to beat. She got the pace last year in the Breeders' Cup Mile when they went 45-1 and one to the half at Santa Anita. She came like a truck and wound up winning that day. I think history repeats itself, and I think Uni is going to be pretty tough in here. Having said that, there's a couple of other runners that I think you need to consider as well. Number two, Kameko comes in off a group two win at Newmarket. We're here into a 127 time form rating. That translates to about a 110 buyer speed figure. So that certainly cannot be ignored. Digital age from the Chad Brown barn. Horse number five is a horse that's coming into his own. A horse that longtime viewers may remember as the original source of the hanger prop that I used with JD once. JD really liked him. And not only did he win that race at Saratoga, he springboarded out of that to win the grade one turf classic at Churchill Downs. Number six, Safe Voyage, is a horse that really intrigues me at a bit of a price. This hits me as a horse that wants it as firm as possible, as far as going is concerned. He was third in a group one last time out over heavy going at Longchamp, but he is far better over a firmer turf course. Back-to-back -back group two wins two and three back, I think is certainly usable at a big price. And I'll also go to the far outside with Raging Bull. I simply think the early pace is going to be very fast, and it may very well be fast enough to allow Raging Bull to sit back well off the pace, navigate a trip from the 14 hole, and rally late for Chad Brown, who has a number of contenders in here. J.D., Nick, the thing that concerns me a little bit is Halliday and factor this. Horses 10 and 13 in the program both have early speed. They both need the lead. If one of them lets the other go early, the one that goes early and gets comfortable on the lead is probably going to win. I don't see that scenario happening. 
your guys' thoughts. JD, I'll let you go first. I, I do think that, you know, when you look at pace dynamic, you know, I made Holiday my, my top choice here, and it's a tepid one at that because looking at the pick four, you know, I begin essentially with six horses, so that tells you my impressions on this. I mean, when you consider the fact, the one aspect of this race that I wanted to kind of jump into is the fact that the Europeans have won 14 of the 36 runnings of this race. If you think of Gold Lakota and Mies combined, they had won five. So Aiden O'Brien's never won this race. So I think at the end of the day, I ask myself, are the Euros good enough? I think Kameko essentially could be the one. And uh, this horse, I think, has enough tactical speed in looking at the European form. I guess the biggest concern is on a firm, fast-type surface, does Kameko have that uh, turn of a foot ability? But, uh, J.D., uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, Andrew seems to think that the 10 and 13 are legitimate speed, and one's not going to give to the other, and it could set up for a closer. But I feel as if speed is kind of the element I want to concentrate on. Yeah, and that's why I have both of them on my ticket, actually, Fair. because I am I am really focusing on the speed. And my top pick is actually Kamiko. And again, I, I kind of agree with you there, Sarge. We're looking at the speed figure numbers here, and, and I'm a time form uh, guy in the States. And obviously, I'm going to look at the time form ratings here for these uh, invaders from Europe. And we're looking at Kamiko and Factor This are both coming off of 131s, which is an, an insane time form speed figure. Yes. And, and really, I'm looking at this as – Andrew's looking at this as a lot of pace for these closers to close into. I think we're going to see a lot of separation in this field, and I don't think there's going to be enough time going the flat mile for these closers to actually pick up the ground. So I've got the, the three, I think, pace factors here in Kamiko, Holiday, and factor this. Now, Kamiko can also – Kamiko does have some versatility, though, so we'll see what uh, what Murphy does on the back for Andrew Balding and see what the uh, what the instructions are. Uh, I'm also got a kind of an interesting long shot on my ticket, and that's Lopi Fernandez, um, who you know you look at the last few races and they don't really match up to this field and they're sprinting. I did rewatch a couple times the one effort that this horse has ever done on a mile, and that was in the Irish 2000 Guineas back in June. And the Trackman comment said that didn't appreciate the added distance. And I just think it was more of the scenario of the race that took a strong lead with a furlong to go and just faltered a little bit. I think it was more conditioning. It was the, the first run off of a almost year layoff. And I think we've got a lot better conditioned horse that just ran at Ascot on October 17th. It wasn't a great effort. It was a seventh place finish beaten beaten three, but I think a very interesting horse to include here. And um, so those are the, uh, the five horses that I have. And I kind of previewed your ticket, Nick, um, but you're also going pretty deep here. As you mentioned, six deep. I am. I I think of the Chad Brown horses, the horse that might get uh, lost in the shuffle as much as I like the sheet pattern, you know, I am a proponent of the rags and sheets. When you look at the digital age, my only concern is, is he going to get that fast pace? Now, Andrew alluded to the fact that potentially Halliday and factor this, they could link up because that's their strong suit. But as much as Raging Bull is a deep closer, I just feel like looking at his sheets, he ended last year with a four and a half on the Ragazins. He began this year with a four and a half and kind of trailed off a little bit. Now he comes in with a seven and a quarter. He's probably sitting on a six to a five which the faster the faster a zero you get, the better you have a chance of winning. I think Raging Bull is interesting here, but it's an ultimate spread race. I don't have a strong opinion, but I, I kind of I kind of lean toward the speed, and that's why I ended up with Halliday for Todd Pletcher. And one note one before the- we move on, J.D., I'm sorry, is I don't have Lopi Fernandez on my ticket, but you know what? If you like connection plays in here, you're getting an Aiden O'Brien, Frankie DeTore horse at 30 to 1. There are far, far, far worse 30 to 1 shots that are going to be available on each of the two Breeders' Cup days. JD, I'm sorry, I just needed to include that before we move on. Oh, yeah, no. And, and the other thing I was going to ask Sarge is we're going to see probably a firm listed turf course, but it's also November in Kentucky and it's been very rainy. So I think it's a different firm rating than what we would see over the course in a summer month at Keeneland. And I do think that's going to, despite being listed as a firm course, I don't think the European horses are necessarily going to have a problem going over it. What are, what are your thoughts about that? 
Well, it's interesting, and I, I, I can send you a video. Actually, Jose Valdivia is riding uh, Windy City Red tomorrow or Friday on Friday's card in the Breeders' Cup uh, Juvenile Turf Sprint. And he actually walked the course, and he sent me kind of a play-by-play -play video of the turf course. It's dried out considerably this week. They got plenty of wind. Um, it's not going to be like uh, Del Mar summer, and for that matter, probably not a Keeneland spring, but it's going to be closer than you think. So it's not going to be one of those – hear your feet rattle type turf courses. But I will tell you this, because the outside periphery of that turf course, you know, when horses work, when it rained last weekend, a lot of divots out there. So if you see horses that are drawn down toward the inside and you see horses that can run inside of horses that are drawn in turf races, don't hesitate to use them because of the fact that I think you're going to see a lot of horses are going to be rallying inside. But I think this turf course is going to play very fair. Um, it's a very long stretch. From the quarter mile off the straight home. So um, I, I think it's going to play very fair. I, I don't think the course in general is going to factor in whether or not they handle it or not. I think it's it's going to be okay for just about everybody. That's all we ask for as handicappers is a fair turf course, right? Amen. Yep. And, and the other thing I was going to mention there, you mentioned Windy City Red. Sarge, obviously good luck to Jonathan Wong, friend of the show, who's who's been a guest on this show. Uh, looking forward to uh, him having a try uh, in Kentucky with uh, what looks to be a very talented colt in Windy City Red. 30 to 1 morning line, but I'm hearing a lot of wise guy uh, type uh, people around throwing that horse's name in what is a very, very open juvenile turf sprint. That's on Friday's card. We're going to stick to Saturday's card, and we're going to move – on to uh, race 10, which is the Breeders' Cup Distaff. Um, this is, you know, we're not calling this another name. We're calling it the Distaff. Thank you. I'm glad that we're back to that. Very Amen. good. And uh, we've, got a, we've got a very interesting uh, field and obviously a, a strong 8-5 to five favorite out on, drawn uh, to the 10 hole. Yeah, Monomoy Girl. Name is very familiar to any horse racing fan out there. She won this race two years ago, spent a long time on the sidelines after, has worked her way back. She's three for three so far this season. Connection's going for win number two in this race, but she's not going to have it easy. Horse number five is the Preakness winner. That is Swiss Skydiver, and this is a horse that always seems to fire. Now, it's been a long campaign for Swiss Skydiver. Is she over the top? We asked this question before the Preakness. All of us went another direction, and we were all dead wrong. Uh, my dad and I split a pick four ticket that would have been live for $1,300 had Authentic gotten his nose down. So that was a particularly brutal heat mm. for me. Yeah, yeah. There's. Uh, I'm not saying what's in here. I'm just, you know, just saying. That was, that was bad. We needed a chaser after that. So a number of people, when you're constructing a multi-race exotic sequence and you come to a race like this, where two horses are going to get bet. Some will say pick one. In my case, I'm slim enough the rest of the way to where I'm throwing both of them in. I'm using horses five and 10. If you were forcing me to pick one, I'd go with Monomoy Girl. I just think she's a little bit faster, a little bit more rested. I think Brad Cox has been working backwards ahead of this race, which is always, always, always a good sign. Brad Cox, a tremendous horseman that's already done a lot in a fairly short amount of time. I will use Swiss Skydiver. There's a chance she's just a throwback horse that keeps running these high-quality races, and maybe she's getting even better towards the end of her three-year-old campaign. The rest of this field, there's not a slouch in the bunch. It's a good field. This is a true grade one race, but Swiss Skydiver and Monomoy Girl certainly seem head and shoulders above the rest. I'm not going to get cute. I'll use them both, and hopefully that's enough. Well, I, I, fair enough. I, I think the, the fact that Swiss Skydiver, you know, opted to go into this race has to mean something. Uh, you know, she did beat Authentic on the square, but she did get the perfect ride that particular day. Um, does she need that type of trip? Does she need to essentially run the same race to win this? Frankly, I think she does, because when you look at sheet numbers, uh, for example, Swiss Skydiver, her, her career best speed figure is a six. She paired that last out. In, in essence, did it two start three starts ago and did it earlier in the year at Oakland Park. So the key is, can she get through that? When you talk numbers, when you look at uh, Monomoy Girl, she's had two races this year. Her last two efforts were both four and three-quarter runs. Does the fastest sheet number guarantee a win? No, it doesn't, because Authentic ran a four on the rags and sheets. And mind you, he had a four-wide trip last out. 
but he still got beat. So the fastest number doesn't guarantee victory. I just think when you look at Monomoy Girl and what she's done, you look at her career, she's had 14 starts, 12 wins, two seconds, and she's ideally drawn. Of the two horses, Swiss Skydiver is authentic. I think that race took more out of Swiss Skydiver than it did authentic. I think authentic is one of those horses he runs the level of his competition, whereas Swiss Skydiver, she runs guts out each and every time. So I know there's no value here. And when you consider the fact that Monomoy Girl is likely going to go off close to your favorite, I'm not guaranteeing she'll be the favorite. I took a stand. And in fact, in the exactas, I'm going to use Ollie's Candy. I think she's a live long shot. She is one of those horses like Authentic. She'll run to the level that she's actually an underachiever, but she's going to be in the mix. So I like her because of her style. I think she's going to be up close. I just don't think Swiss Skydiver, she's never seen the likes of Monomoy Girl being an older horse. He's faced three and three-year-olds this year and done what she's done, and no disrespect to her because if she wins, Authentic wins the Classic, and guess who's your horse of the year? It's going to be Swiss Skydiver. Yeah, it's uh, tough to argue against. I'm glad you mentioned Ollie's Candy because Ollie's Candy to me is a horse you need to at least throw in second or third in your exotics because of late, she's not a horse that really shows she wants to win, but she's another that runs guts out every time. And you don't want to be in a situation where a horse like that, who is going to be an inflated price as compared to her ability, breaks up an exactor or a try, and the exactor or the try pays a ridiculous amount of money compared to what it should. So certainly good wisdom there. JD, your thoughts? Well, it's funny that you mentioned Ollie's Candy because I actually am adding a horse that beat Ollie's Candy last time out in the mm. Judmont Spinster, and that's the Eight Valiants. And, and really, this is kind of a, a fresh angle. Pletcher ended up with this uh, horse on the on the dirt after the Eatontown got washed off a grade three event at Monmouth and won by a length and a half. And just a super a super performance last time in the spinster uh time form 122 which puts this horse obviously it's just one race right in the thick of things but kind of a, a fresh shooter on the scene that i think is pretty tactical and obviously has louis Saez up so if they want to send out of the gate they have that in their back pocket as well um i i think obviously a a fresh shooter here and it's just kind of a, a case where you know if the two favorites have kind of given their effort for the year and somebody's going to be right there to pick up the pieces in the last 200 meters, I really think that the, that the eight's going to be the horse to do that. So I'm going three deep here, and you're going to see my ticket kind of get skinnier as we go down the line here talking about ticket structure. But a very interesting edition of the Breeders' Cup Distaff on Saturday. Indeed, uh -huh. and so far there are ways in which all three of us can be alive through two legs. This is not always the case, folks. This does not always happen. Now, as we go forward, there will be ways in which two out of three of us can hit, but all three of us cannot. This is called foreshadowing, kids, as we move on to the Breeders' Cup turf. And my goodness, do the American turf horses look overmatched, at least in my opinion. We've got a field of 10 runners in here, a lot of these coming in from overseas. Your morning line favorite is the Mare Magical, horse number two in your program. And her biggest problem over the course of her career is she came around around the same time as Enable, and she kept running into Enable over and over and over again. She comes back to the States. The question is, as a five-year-old mare, can she channel the form that she has shown overseas? There's a lot of low to mid 120 time form ratings, which again, translate to 108, 109, 110 buyer speed figures. Can she channel that kind of performance? I am using Magical here, but Magical is not my top pick. My top pick is number three, Tarnawa, a four-year-old filly from the Dermot Weld Barn who has come into her own as a four-year-old. She is three for three with a pair of group one victories, one at a mile and a half. The race two back that she ran at Longchamp was excellent. That was over firm going. She's going to get firmer going here. And then she comes back in the Prix de l'Opera, wins over heavy going, going a mile and a quarter. I think she is a classy racehorse at the peak of her powers, has won five of her last six starts, the lone misfire coming in the British champions at Ascot over soft going. And it's safe to assume something went wrong that day because we didn't see her again until August. Turn out was six to one on the morning line. I'll take the under on that. If you want to go a little bit deeper, if you want a single one of Monomoy Girl or Swiss Skydiver, maybe you use number six, Lord North, 
who looked like one of the best turf horses in the world earlier this year. I just think maybe he's tailing off a little bit. You could also use Mogul from the Aiden O'Brien barn. All he is is a three-year-old that ran a best race of his career last time out and winning a group one at Longchamp going a mile and a half. You could do a heck of a lot worse than that on your ticket in the Breeders' Cup turf. But I'm looking at this race, and I see Arklow at 5-1. to one. I see Channel Maker at 5-1. to one. It, it, The morning line here, as it pertains to the American horses, if these horses go off at these prices, in my opinion, they are ridiculous underlays. The one American horse in here that I think may have a chance is number seven, United, but it's a situation that's very close to the way I see the Breeders' Cup mile in that United wants to be on or near the lead, so does Channel Maker. I think the presence of one really hurts the other. Now, United can rate a little bit, and he ran a big race last year running second to Bricks and Mortar. The other question with United is, can he do it outside of California? There are some questions here. I'm sticking with the Euros on this ticket two and three. If you're playing a wider ticket or you're looking for some B horses, throw in the six or the 10. Those are also European horses. I just think the European runners look very, very powerful in here. JD, um, I'd like to hear your two cents because, you know, when you look at the, <clears throat> excuse me, the pace scenario, is it is it a situation that the Americans essentially set off and dictate terms? I don't necessarily feel that that's the case because when you look at uh, the likes of Mogul, you know, this is a horse that, again, he's very tactical. He's young, extremely well-bred, being by uh, the great Galileo, brings in the same connections that bring you magical, which between the owner-trainer combo of the Coolmore group, Aiden O'Brien, they're the winningest tandem in this race, having won at six races. So for me, at first look, I feel like Mogul, under a rider that uh, many not be may not be real familiar with, and Pierre Charles Boudot, you know this is a top French jockey. This horse was scratched out of the arc uh, due to "quote unquote" feed contamination. It may have been a blessing this guy's because you had a horse that came off of the uh, the Grand Prix at uh, Longchamp, and that effort was his career best time for him. So I'm going to leave it at that, and we'll come back to the other coverage I have. But JD, how do you see the pace scenario? Yeah, I, I really think Mogul's going to be out there on the pace, and I think Mogul's a must-include on your tickets here. Um, and I, I'm playing against Magical here, and, and there's some reasoning why. I think a mile-and-a-half distance has not been Magical's best distance over the last couple of years. You look at the last time this horse won at the distance, you have to go back to 2018, and that was a race right. before, um, obviously, that Magical finished second in the Breeders' Cup turf in 2018 as well. I, I just don't think magical and a, and a mile and a half is, is really the distance that the mayor wants to get over. So I'm going to try to beat her here as with Andrew. Uh, my top selection is going to be Tarnawa. And um, I, I really do think that the mile and a half form is kind of my big play here. And the other thing I like is there's three uh, mile and a half victories in the campaign this year. So obviously just fourth race of the year. And they've been mile and a half wins over firm going soft going and good listed tracks so literally has seen a little bit of everything and i think would be the, the the horse that can close into mogul i will give a little bit of a look at at channel maker i don't think channel maker is going to be five to one i think channel maker is probably going to be eight and eight or nine to one um and andrew is giving me the the position that he thinks he's going to be double digits um but i, I do look at the last couple races and and they're very impressive on paper do they stack up to what the European horses have been doing? I don't know, but we'll see if Channel Maker can go with Mogul or if uh, Manny Franco takes a more tactical approach. But I do think out of the American contingent, that would be the horse that is interesting to me. And I also like Lord North, obviously not coming in with the best form, losing by 13 and a half the last uh, time out at Royal Ascot. But you go back earlier in the campaign, there's some good, uh, there's some good races there. I, I just think kind of got shuffled midfield, didn't like the run, wasn't really interested in running that day. I'm willing to excuse that effort. So I'm going four deep here, three, six, nine, and 10, Sarge. So I went, I went five deep, two, three, five, nine, ten, 10. And, you know, I just wanted to make mention, for example, when you, when you look at the Ragazin sheet and you look at Magical's number through the years, in fact, when Magical hooked into Enable a few years back, in the Breeders' Cup, 
that would have essentially got me out on the day because magical was the my best bet of the day. Oh. And uh, when <laughs> when everybody had jumped, obviously for for good reason on enable, I said nope. I said magical's going to get the last laugh here, and you know magical came with her A game. But when you look at the rags and sheep, the thing that really stands out at the end of her career last year, do you remember they announced her retirement? Yep. So on the Ragazins, it shows retired. The good news for her, when you look at her numbers in 18, 19, and 20, she hasn't regressed. But the question is, when you compare the fact that Mogul is a three-year-old, there's so much upside there. But of the American contingent, I mean, Mogul ran a career best six on the sheets if you translate it here. But when you look at Channel Maker, something has to give. I can't see Manny Franco taking back. And the fact that that horse might gain separation because he's a send rider, he is what is he that literally the only American I keep on the ticket because I went two, three, five, nine, ten. Donja was my big German long shot. I'll use that horse in exotics, but you know if the pace melts, it's going to come running. But I'm with you guys on Tanawa. That horse looks fantastic. Dermot Weld, the guy's legendary. He's no stranger uh, to winning, uh, you know, across across the water. Yeah. yeah, there are a lot of fun things going on in here. A lot of European runners with some chances. And I'm happy that you mentioned Donja because, look, this is a European runner that's 30 to 1 on the morning line getting Lasix for the first time. I go. tend to agree with Tom Amos in that Lasix isn't a performance enhancer, but it can be a performance enabler, especially with European runners that have never had it before. So that's certainly worth noting. And Donja will be on some of my exotics tickets as well because does the horse need to run a career best race to win? Absolutely. But that horse could very easily run third at, say, 47 to 1 and blow up some tickets. So certainly a horse that I think is worth consideration. And I'm happy that you brought up Donja as we now look ahead to the main event of the Saturday program, the Breeders' Cup Classic, a race that may very well decide Horse of the Year honors. This is a tremendous group of horses that's going postward. We'll have a field of 10. The Bob Baffert trio on the far outside looms very large. Improbable is the morning line favorite at 5-2. to two. Then you have Authentic. Then you have Maximum Security, the star-crossed Maximum Security. Tis the law breaking from post position number two. Three to one on the morning line. My prediction is Tis the Law goes favored. I think that line comes down a little bit. Having said that, none of the horses that I've just mentioned is my top selection. My top selection comes from the crafty barn of Al Stahl, who, as oh. you will remember, won this race with blame many, many years ago. Hi, Ren Carruthers. How you doing? Tom's Day Todd. Horse number four in your program. I've got a question for both of you. If you cross out the Whitney, where he fell flat on his face right out of the gate and never had a chance, what are his morning line odds in this race? Probably seven to two-ish. I would say I would say absolutely. But I, I based on the morning line, I think people are going to jump to the fact that they see six to one and get excited. You're not going to get six to one. You're probably going to be at right around seven to two to four to yeah. one, in my opinion. I think that's probably about right. Having said that, people were buzzing about Tom's Day tie after his win in the Stephen Foster, and for good reason. This is a horse that is coming into his own as a seven year old. Kudos to the connections for keeping a horse like this in training so that he could mature and reach the potential that he showed in some instances back in 2017 and 2018. He had some injuries at the start of his career. He's healthier now. He's sound now. He's going a longer distance of ground, which he should love, being by smart strike out of a Giants Causeway mare. And I'm tossing the Whitney. That horse had no chance after that start, chasing a very, very slow pace. He's been back on the beam at Churchill Downs. I love the back-to-back -back six furlong drills on October 17th and October 24th. He's got enough tactical speed to work out his own trip beneath Joel Rosario. And I think an on-his-game Tom's Day Ta will be tough to beat. I will use number two, Tis the Law. I will use number nine, Authentic. On either of their best days, they're good enough to win this. They're three-year-olds that are developing late in the season. But I'm not going to use Improbable. That was a tough toss for me, wow. but the more I look at a couple of races he's run, the more I think he's been the beneficiary of some really good racing luck. Not to say he cannot run well in here, 
but I do think he's going to be a little bit of an underlay compared to his actual chances of winning. He capitalized on a great stalking trip in the Gold Cup at Santa Anita. He was on a very slow pace in the Whitney, and then the awesome again just fell apart. You go 46-1 and one, the opening half at Santa Anita. Remember, this is oh. not Santa Anita of 15, 20 years ago. It is a very deep, very trying surface. That race completely fell apart to no one's surprise. I'm also going to throw out maximum security. Maximum security came back from Saudi Arabia. We know what happened with Jason Service. I'm not going to spend any time on that. He gets moved to Bob Baffert. Wins the San Diego. Eh. Wins the Pacific Classic, took a bit of a step forward that day, but did so with a pretty easy lead, going the mile and a quarter at Del Mar with the shorter stretch. It was fine. It didn't knock my socks off. It was good. They bring him back in the awesome again, and he winds up rating a little bit. Maybe they were trying to teach him something. Maybe Luis Saez just thought the pace was a little bit too fast, but... I just prefer others in this spot. If maximum security wins this and makes me look like a fool, so be it. I'm finishing things off going three deep, two, four, nine. Tom's Day Tide is my top selection. This pick four costs $30. Hopefully we beat a couple of favorites along the way and make this pay a little bit because the pool will be enormous. And I cannot stress that enough. If you need another reason to get involved, there's going to be a couple million dollars in this late pick four pool. And, and Sarge, I, I want to toss it to you here because you, you kind of uh, threw me the question about uh, the pace scenario in the last race. I'm very curious to see what you think of the pace scenario, specifically with the four outside horses uh, in this Breeders' Cup Classic. Well, it's obviously it, – it looks busy on paper, right? Um, I think even the case can be made for, for Tacitus, who w would likely want to be a bit more forwardly placed and, and probably shove away from there at the start, as well as tis the law. I don't think tis the law. People understand and realize how fast he really is. And the fact that he's drawn down toward the inside, the last thing that I, I think Manny Franco is going to want to do is break and take a hold. So something's got to give with the Baffert horses because when you consider the fact that the last six Breeders' Cup Classics, it was Bob Baffert that won three straight with three three-year-olds back to back to back with Byron, of course, he came back with American Pharaoh and then the late great to Arrogate. Uh, do I think Authentic is uh, mentioned in the same breath as Arrogate? Probably not from a brilliant standpoint, but as far as his, his capacity and talent, he certainly ranks way up there. And I think people still underestimate his talent. Maximum Security clearly runs his best race when he's engaged. So right then and there, you've got post position nine and 10. Is this a situation that Baffert, tells both riders, hey, look, you got to play the break here. Based on Baffert's interviews throughout the week, based on what we've seen, for example, at Breakfast of the Breeders' Cup with, with TVG and the Gallops, authentic and improbable of the Baffert horses look far and away the best. Andrew brought up an interesting point. Source came back from Saudi Arabia. True, he did end up winning the San Diego. True, he did come back and win the Pacific Classic. But who did he beat? He beat Sharp Samurai in midcourt. Where are they? I mean, granted, Samurai will be on the Breeders' Cup card, but is he a horse that really anybody's talking about? So if you're looking for the value and maximum security is your horse, now is the time to bet him because this is just my opinion. I think he's going to run Saturday. He's either going to retire, or if he wins, he's going to carry on. I think if he gets beat Saturday, it's over for maximum security. I'm not willing to take that risk. So pace scenario-wise, because he's the fresh horse, he's the young horse, I think authentic, all he needs to do is break, and he's going to be on the lead. So in, in regards to your ticket, uh, Nick, you're going you're going three deep here, and, and obviously right. um, you've got Tom's Zeta on, on your ticket as well. Kind of similar reasoning to, to Andrew there, or did you see a, a, another angle for um, – No, I, I think, you know, I, I took a couple of different views there because when you look, for example, at his rag is in pattern, for example, he ran a career best two – two starts back, but the way the trainer and, and uh, Al Stahl has handled Tom's the Ta this year, look, if the horse broke last out in the Whitney, it may have been an entirely different story. And I think yeah. that's what's going to help your value. So you're just kind of banking on him breaking well. I looked at his career, and you can't necessarily find a race where he broke slow outside of his debut uh, or 
way back in May of 2016 when he ran up the track on grass first time out. The rest is history because his form is brilliant. But I think at the end of the day, Tom Zata is going to have the tactical advantage because he is rateable. He can stalk. I just think those horses to the inside, I think tis the law. I think Manny Franco is going to gun away from there. And I think that pace scenario is going to get hot. Tom's the top patient ride from Joel Rosario. It's going to be him and improbable finishing on terms late. Whoever has the fastest kick, if they let authentic get a breather, then guess what? They're all running for a second, but I'm not thoroughly convinced he's going to get a breather, but Tom's the top has to be used based on how well he's looked all week. I think visually for me, in this particular race, he and Authentic have looked best and probable being right there. And I, I'm going a little bit of a, of a different direction here. I'm actually going to single tis the law in this situation. Whoa! And I think, I wow. Think you actually kind of made my point for me is I think Manny Franco is going to send, and I'm looking at everything on the outside, and I think a key here is Global Campaign, the seven. Global campaign could very well be a New York traffic in this race. And what I, and that's kind of in two factors. You look three back. I mean, this horse made a New York traffic light right turn out of the gate and could right. cost the early position out of those three outside Baffert horses. If he actually breaks cleanly, then he's going to be part of the pace scenario. I don't see Castellano having any other choice but to send him. So he's going to force improbable, authentic, maximum security probably to take a little bit of a wider trip. And I just think that's going to create a hole where Manny's going to go, but I think Manny's not going to have to go necessarily as hard early to get at least in a position to where a share of the lead may be trailing by a head, but getting the inner rail and riding it around for the, the mile and a quarter. I, I, I really like how Tiz the Law finishes races. And obviously you look at the, the last time out in the Derby and okay, that was one scenario where Tiz the Law maybe didn't finish the race, but I'm willing to look at the horse that we saw in the Travers, the horse that we saw in the Belmont and show that, okay, when push comes to shove, this horse can finish a race. And I think based on the positioning of the race, I think with Manny going to the lead, I really like Tis the Law with a, a chance to gate to wire this field. Andrew, you have a question, sir. It's not a question, but I want to point something out. Way, way, way back when we started this show, there were three or four straight instances where you made no secret about your disdain for Tis the Law from a betting perspective. You have evolved. You have come full circle. And now if you are alive in this late pick four, you will be pinning all of your hopes, dreams, and aspirations on a wow. horse that you vociferously rooted against for much of his campaign to this point. I just have to ask, how does that feel? I, I will say this. I, I think you're going to get fair value on Tis the Law. Yeah. And it's probably the first time in a while I think you're getting fa fair value. I mean, I think three to five in the Derby was crazy. Obviously, two to five in the Travers, based on that field, made a little more sense. But three to five in the Derby was just absolutely insane. Um, so you're going to get fair value. I think you're looking at somewhere between five to two to seven to two, uh, based on how much money the Baffert's take. And if they take money away from each other, which is going to be interesting from a paramutual standpoint of, we're going to see a lot of people that will have authentic as their top Baffert horse. We're going to see people that are going to bet maximum security. We're going to see people that are going to bet improbable. Um, I'm really curious to see paramutually what you can do, but I don't think there's going to be you know, anybody under two to one in this, in this field. And that's where I think it, it's very interesting to find value here in the last leg. And obviously in the last leg of a multi-race exotic, you know, you're, you still want some value if you're going to single on a big day like this. And I think there's going to be enough value in Tis the law. And I'm confident enough in how I feel the race is going to unfold for Tis the law that I can make a strong single stand there. You know, we kid, and I intentionally sort of sting it every once in a while. But this is why I love doing this show, because I can ask a completely sarcastic question out of my rear end and get an answer that makes a lot of sense. JP, <laughs> thank you very much for that. Now, as we've mentioned, there are three pick four tickets, one from each of us. All three of us cannot hit. JD is going out on a limb using a horse that Nick did not use. However, there's enough common ground for two out of three of us to hit and it's not going to take an inconceivable situation for that to potentially happen. So now I believe JD is going to cycle through all of our tickets here. Sarge has a $45 ticket singling Monomoy Girl in the distaff. I have a $30 ticket that does not single because I am a gutless coward. 
but it does go a little bit narrow in legs two and three. Hopefully we get Tom's Day Tahoe home in the last, or we get a price home in the mile. JD, meanwhile, signaling tis the law in the Breeders' Cup Classic, race number 12 on a 12-race program at Keeneland on Saturday. It's a great program. However you want to get involved, we urge you to do so. Now, as we've mentioned, we're concentrating on the late pick four because it's a really cool sequence with a lot of the best horses in the world in training. Having said that, there are a lot of other races on the Saturday card where we think you can take stands and potentially make some money. So the three of us are going to go through and give you a price play each to watch. This is going to be really cool because we're each we're coming from completely different places. I talked to JD very briefly. I know where he's going. He knows where I'm going. I do not have any idea where the Sarge is going, and I'm very interested in hearing about this. So, Nick, if you've got a price play for Saturday at Keeneland outside of the late pick four, where are you going? Well, as far as price play, I think the, the reality is what you're trying to accomplish. You know, so many people will they'll pick up the DRF, their Brisnet PPs, Equibase PPs, and immediately they'll, they'll kind of run to the horse that they like, right? Um for me, I kind of take the opposite approach. I actually go through the card and I determine horses that I think are bad favorites. And then I try to find value in that particular race. And in my mind, the race that stands out is the big ass fans Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile. We can say that here. Big ass fans Breeders' Cup and Dirt Mile. And as a matter of fact, it's a contractual requirement. If you're referencing the Dirt Mile, right. you have to say big ass fans Dirt Mile. Beautiful. So when you look at complexity, you know, this is a horse that I almost felt, I almost felt picking up the phone and calling Chad Brown and saying, Chad, I know you're, you're a genius trainer and you've, you've had tremendous success in your career, but do yourself a favor and run complexity in the Breeders' Cup sprint. I think complexity would have been a perfect fit. The fact that he's two to one in that race, he is a play against for me. Nick's go at seven to two. I'm like, if Nick's go can come where anywhere near that two and a quarter that he earned for Brad Cox and his second start for that barn, then it's all over but the shouting. I know that folks have actually touted the War of Will. I don't think War of Will has the, the turn of foot uh, to be the winner in this particular race. I wouldn't deny him in the exotics. But as far as patterns go, I love Pirates Punch. Pirates Punch uh, began the year with a five on the rags and sheets. His most recent try he ran a five and a half. I think he has the perfect style for this race. I think he sits the ultimate trip. He's 20 to one on the morning line. I'm going to play him in every single exotic. In addition to the fact that I'm going to throw complexity out, I don't mind tying up some exactos with Nick's go because Brad Cox, obviously horses run for him. And that horse is coming off of a monster win. If Nick's go doesn't bounce, then they're all running for a second. So my price play on that Breeders' Cup card is Pirates Punch. He's 20 to one on the morning line coming in. In theory, coming in with two wins, he shouldn't have been disqualified uh, two back. That was a terrible disqualification in the uh, Island, but he's coming in sharp for uh, Grant Forrester, who's a very underrated horseman. I like Pirate's Punch as well. I think he stands, wait for it, wait for it, a puncher's chance. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Maybe you do a parlay with Pirate's Punch and Raging Bull. Huh? 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 I'll stop with the dad jokes now because I'm going to focus on race number four of the Breeders' Cup program. This is the Philly and Mare Sprint. This is speed on speed on speed. Number two, Gamin. A lot's been made of her by us, especially a couple of weeks ago when we had Gina Bacola on the show. She's going to go early. I'm not going to touch the other stuff. She's going to go early. In the midst of Biz is going to go early. Venetian Harbor is going to go early, or the owners are going to kill someone. Not, not to interrupt you, Andrew, but to end amidst the bid scratch today due okay. to the fever. So Robert, good. There's, there's still enough speed in the race yes. to where I think it's going to be tough. Venetian Harbor is going to go. Serengeti Empress is going to go. Yeah. And I think that sets things up for the closers in the race. There are a couple here that have a lot to potentially accomplish. Bell's the one is going to be the closer that takes most of the money. Now, Neil Pesson, tremendous story here. This guy does not have a lot of horses. He's run 57 starters. He's got five wins. Two have been in graded stakes races with this filly. Bell's the one is a very good horse. 
Sally's Curlin is a horse that's getting some buzz based on some of the efforts she had earlier this year. She ran third last time out in a grade one at Churchill. I don't think she's going to be 20 to one. I think she'll be in the 12 to one, 15 to one range based off of what I'm hearing. Right. The one that I really like though, and this stings as a Michigan fan for reasons any college football fan will be able to, to see is number five, Sconson. Sconson last time wow. out got the benefit of a really good race shape in the eight bells. They went 22 to the quarter, 44 to the half. Having said that, Churchill was playing pretty kind to speed over the course of the Oaks and Derby Day programs. Sconson rallied from last to first, was eight lengths back at the first call, came flying home to win by two and a quarter. 20 to one on the morning line, and especially with the scratch of in the midst of biz, I think Sconson might be the longest shot on the board. That would hit me as a significant overlay. Now, she did take a step forward last time out in the eight bells, going from an 86 buyer to a 96 buyer. She probably needs to take another step forward. But this is a three-year-old filly late in the season, coming in off a little bit of a rest, some steady works for trainer Greg Foley, who's another underrated conditioner, hitting at an 18% clip this year. At her likely price, I need to use her. And if the race completely falls apart, I will be screaming from the top of my lungs here in Northern California on Sconson. Yeah, nice. I like it. Yeah. At that kind of price, I need to use her. So obviously, I, if you if you follow the show, I only have one direction I can go here because there is a horse that I have said on this show that I feel like is the best sprinter in North America, and in the Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint, this horse is double digit odds right now. So I have to put my money where my mouth is and go with the eight Alexandra in the uh, Breeders' Cup Turf Sprint. Very interesting field here because we have probably a lot of the early pace horses. I would put in the cheaper speed type category and obviously it's you know that's a relative term in the breeders cup but you look at a horse like just might i mean the last win was a a a starter stake at the fairgrounds and you know has not seen this level of competition really um you know so there's going to be a lot of speed early on and obviously you know the favorite in the race or who will likely be the favorite is going to be got stormy and got stormy is going to try to do really what Alexandra is going to want to do, which is, which is close because obviously got Stormy's on this weird campaign going from being a, a miler and, and more to a, a sprinter later on in her career. Um, so I really do like Alexandra. Now the key to Alexandra always is closing. So there's got to be enough speed to go. And I think there is, I also think that Alexandra is going to be ignored on the board because people are going to look at Neil Drysdale off the layoff, and that's never been a great angle, um, and the numbers show. But I love the work pattern that he's done, and, and basically you've seen it twice this year. Um, obviously getting ready for the Monrovia off of the 227-day layoff, you saw a very simple, similar pattern of, of work that you're, that you're going to find to before this race. So you saw basically a, a four furlongs, a several four furlongs, a couple quick ones, and then a couple five furlongs, and then boom, race. And in this case, we've seen the progression from three furlong, four furlong, four furlong going fast, five furlong to six furlong drills. I, I do think Alexandra in the Jiper, that was a great performance. Anything close to that performance, closing late, I think she's going to be right in the mix. And can she outkick Got Stormy? That's going to be the question that I'm looking to answer, answer because there's enough speed for either of those horses. I think they're both similar closers, but you're getting probably three to one. When all said and done on Got Stormy, you're probably going to get 15 to one or more on Alexandra. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's a great point out. I mean, the fact that she's also had a win over this course, you know, considering that, and, uh, you know, she's two for four at the distance, never been out of the exacta. And you've got a Hall of Fame trainer uh, in her corner. I think it's a little interesting that she actually prepped and worked up at Belmont. So as opposed to being here on the left coast. So after the Yiper, he just kept her out there. And I think based on that it alone, I think she, she's a that, that race there. It obviously Langster 
is the horse for course and has done so much there at Keeneland. But being that horse is four to one in the morning line tells you how wide open that event is. No kidding. If you're looking at a European runner in there, I think Glass Slippers might have a big time shot. European getting first time Lasix was a good second in a group one last time out. Yeah. Won a group one two back and is another runner that may like the ground on the firmer side. This is a runner that was quick enough last year to run five furlongs in 55 and three overseas. That's flying. That's one that I'd recommend you use. But JD, kidding aside, Oleksandra at that price would be a must use as well. It's a fantastic betting race. Who the heck knows what the tote board's going to look like? That was a situation where it just looked like every horse was somewhere in between 10 to 1 and 15 to 1. And wherever it shakes out, it shakes out. But if you get that kind of price, dump the Brinks truck at the window if for Alexandra, because yeah. that's that hits me as a lot of value. So, regardless of what you think about our selections, our pick four tickets, you have to agree there's a lot of value coming up over the next couple of days at Keeneland. For the Breeders' Cup World Thoroughbred Championships, horse racing's year-end event. We said it on yesterday's show with Ren Carruthers, and we'll say it now. There is so many reasons to get involved in whatever way you can, from a betting standpoint, from a watching standpoint, from just being a fan. There's so much to sift through. There's so much to digest. This is going to be a lot of fun over the next couple of days, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how it plays out, not just as – someone that's made some money in the game, not just as somebody that writes about it and talks about it, but as a fan. These are the days that we live for as horse racing fans, and I'm pumped. I'm stoked. This is going to be a really, really, really good event. Well, in light of the world and uh, what 2020 has uh, brought just us. Just the to... last week. Forget about the previous uh, 10 months. Just the last week. Yeah. So <laughs> bottom line is stay in your horse racing bubble this weekend. Stay focused, and uh, hopefully you can make a few dollars. And on account of uh, the information that we brought to you today, I mean, I, I feel good about uh, all the information that we provide. Yeah. I feel great. This is good. This is really good. J.D., your final thoughts as we move into the Breeders' Cup. I, I just want to say this has been a crazy horse racing week because obviously we had the Melbourne Cup at the beginning of the week. We have some great stakes action in Australia. So if you're if you're feeling good, there there's – so there's multiple group one activities going on at Flemington on Friday night. You get a little bit of money from the uh, Future Stars Friday card. There's a great card at Flemington that you can uh, sink your teeth into, and to, including two of the top 15 horses right now in the Long Jeans World Rankings are running at Flemington wow. on Friday night. So it's it's been a crazy week, and I've tried my best to keep up with all of it. And I, the one thing I'll also say is, obviously, you know, Keeneland is going to be different. It's going to be a different Breeders' Cup environment. But I, I do see that, you know, there have been a lot of horsemen that have that have come out and gone to the Lexington area and are kind of doing their own thing and, and having their, their own private parties and that sort of thing. So I'm just, you know, reiterating everybody be safe, socially distance, wear your masks, all of those good things uh, because, you know, with, with everything that's going on in the world, it, you know, it may, you know, it may, it may be – Great for you guys to come around and um, have camaraderie around horse racing and the and the best event of the year. But but use your brain, wear a mask, all of that. Said Andrew. Yeah. I hit on something you probably were going to say, so I apologize. Uh, a little bit, yeah. Um, you hit on the mask stuff, and that's one thing. But if this week has taught us anything, let's just be kind to one another. I feel as though, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, whatever you think, whatever you feel, we could do a lot better job being kinder to one another as a society and being able to come together and be able to work some stuff out. Because if this week has shown us anything, we've got a lot of stuff that we've got to work out as a society. We're hoping we get there. And if we can get there in working together and being able to come together for a common good, that's the ball game right there. So my message, it's as nonpartisan as it gets. It's a quote the great Pat Oswalt in one of his Netflix specials. It's chaos behind. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate All right. that. Um, yeah, so on that note, though, it's chaos be kind unless your money is against my money at the window <laughs> in the next couple of days. I had to bring it back. I couldn't end on that kind of note. Oh, I, I was happy and inspirational. I'm just like, you know what? Yeah, it's chaos. Be kind. 
if we're both in a photo together, JD, I hope I get the bob and you don't. Yeah. <laughs> I hope you don't seem to. Hey, you know, it's just, it, it, it is what it is at this point. But regardless, this has been a lot of fun. I'm enjoying doing this. We've really had a good time doing this show since it started back in March. If you like what we're doing, go down and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our weekly offerings. You can also go back and check out any of our interviews that we've had with people in horse racing, people in the gambling world. We've been privileged to be able to do a lot of cool stuff. And the more that we can do for you, the viewer, the better the show is going to be. So take a watch. Let us know what you think. If there's something you want us to cover, if there's a question you have, we're easy to find. You can see down there, those are our social media feeds. So we're very active, sometimes to our detriment. And, you know, we'll see what happens. Sarge, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us this evening. Where can people find you? What are some of the fun things you've got going on? Well, you can find me at Hindsight, H-I-N-E-S-I-T-E, and uh, Jack of all trades, uh, trying to master at least one, if you will. But uh, between TVG, been doing the uh, the quarters work over the weekends. Uh, I'll be on throughout the weekend on the heels of Breeders' Cup, but uh, also uh, plan is attending the upcoming Team of November sale in a perfect world of uh, imperfection. So keep doing the horse thing. Battleborn Racing Stable continues to move forward, and uh, you know where to find me at Hindsight. You betcha. Sarge, thank you so much. We thank really you. appreciate it. And we hope that you all out there in YouTube land have enjoyed the two shows that we've brought to you this week. Hopefully you make some money at Breeders' Cup time. You only have to be right once or twice in order to make a pretty nice chunk of change. So for J.D. Fox and Nick Hines, I'm Andrew Champagne. Good luck at the Breeders' Cup. But for the love of everything holy, stay off the beaches. <laughs>